Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 207. Looks like kids' games, but they're not. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight we're talking about games that look like kids' games, but aren't. We've run into quite a few of these in the last couple of years and thought it was worth talking about because it just seems to keep happening. Now, to go with that, we've got two reviews that actually fit this trend. Uh, first off, the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game from Renegade Game Studios and the Turning the Tide expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances from The Op. I apologize for those name lengths. We're then going to wrap up with some supers gaming from Sean. For links to all of the various games and other things we mentioned during the show, check out our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 207. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content. First, a comment from Per Soli on our topic of break time games. They wrote, I see one channel called them 530 games. Five minutes to teach, max 30 minutes to play. In my country, people don't play games on their lunch break. I remember we sometimes played poker on lunch break at high school. Las Vegas and for sale were not mentioned. Well, thanks for the comment, Per. Um, I'm sure you're somewhere in the world where you don't get to play games during your breaks. Uh, here, places are pretty lax on what you do. In general, break time is considered your time, and what you want to do with it is up to you. Now, I gotta say, those are a couple of great suggestions with Las Vegas and For Sale. They're just not games I personally own, but I have played other people's copies, and they fit that 5.30 thing well. Though right now, it feels a little weird saying 5.30 games. I think I, I like it, but it just kind of feels awkward for some reason. But maybe just because I haven't really used it much. Uh, it reminds me of uh, talking about oil. Uh, you want to top up with some 5.30 in there? Yeah. <laughs> Well, next up, a comment from Preston Griffith that fits in with our reviews later tonight. It's in regards to our Disney Sorcerer's Arena coverage. Preston asks, did you all have any issues with the standees being extremely wobbly inside the base? I only have two characters who fit snug inside them. Out. Well, when I first replied to this comment online where it was posted, I hadn't had this problem at all. My base game was perfectly fine. Everything fit snug. It wasn't until cracking open the expansions that I started to see this happen. Now, my Davy Jones in particular is super loose and my Mother Gothel isn't great. Now, I will say I'm batting better than Preston with only two loose ones, but this is definitely seems to be a problem with this game. Now, I was personally thinking of gluing mine and just storing them all standing up either on a shelf or maybe just keep one of the expansion boxes just to hold the standees. But there's a problem with that, at least so far, that doesn't work with Sully, because Sully is so big, you won't be able to remove the ring if you put glue him to the base. Um, so I'm not sure. I, the one thing I thought of is do that and just pick a color, red or blue, and whoever drafts Sully plays that color, which is fine. But if I start playing organized play or something, it could be an issue. Now, another suggestion I saw online that might be worth trying is to put a layer of clear tape over the tab at the bottom of the standee. Now, I've seen this done with other games. Uh, Flick 'em Up in particular had this for the buildings, and it worked great there. So I think it'll probably work here. Now, this is something I probably will try before resorting to glue. Well, next, an amusing comment on our Quest Pyramid review. David McCord writes, I got this for my wife at Christmas. She spent a few hours on it, got a few bits figured out. Then my nine-year-old grandson came over. Yep, solved it in half an hour. <laughs> Kids! Nice. Uh, that is one thing with these puzzles, though, is all it usually takes is another set of eyes or someone who thinks about things in a different way or approaches it without any preconceived notions. Uh, that's actually what worked with us for the um, House of the Dragon puzzle. It was actually my daughter that got us unstuck for the same reason. She grabbed it and immediately started doing something I never thought of and got further than we did. Well, thanks everyone for your comments, replies, and feedback. While we might not read all of them out on the show, we greatly appreciate any and all comments. Next up, an announcement about next week. We've got one important note about next week before we move on with the rest of the show. So next Wednesday, May the 10th, we will not be here live on Twitch recording the next episode of our podcast. 
uh, Deanna and I are going to be celebrating our anniversary out of town, and we're not going to be getting home until later in the day on Wednesday. Not only is that going to make recording at 8 p.m. rough, because I don't even know when we're going to get home, it also means I'm not going to have the lead-up time to do any prep work before the show. With no live show, that means no new podcast, so expect a one-week gap in most of our content. Now, we do have some video reviews saved up and some unboxings and some other stuff we can trickle out, but there won't be a new Ask the Bellhop segment or a new full episode to check out next week. So we'll see you here, hopefully, back on Twitch in two weeks. Now it's time for us to stop into the lobby and say hi to the awesome folks who join us live here on Twitch. While we do cut this content from the podcast, you can join in by joining us live Wednesday nights at 8, or hear what happens by becoming a hotel guest level Patreon patron, as those these segments are included in bonus audio we send out to the patrons. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we're going to be sharing a list of games that look like they're for kids, but they are not. So this is something I don't remember noticing until, I don't know, last three years, maybe last five years. I, I didn't double check the list to see when the first one of these came out, but it just seems to be happening more and more often where a game comes out with a license or a look or an art style or a packaging type that just screams, this is a game for kids. This is a mass market game your kids will love. And then you get the game home and you go to play it and you're like, whoa, this, there, there is no way my kids are going to grasp this. Now, I'm not supposed to say my kids, my kids. I mean, like kids in general, the average sixth grader is not going to grab grasp this game or the average six year old is not going to get this game, depending on how it looks. As always, whenever we talk about kids games, we have to generalize to some degree. Every child is going to be different and process things in different ways and uh, mm -hmm. be, you know, be more or less mature based on a million different factors. Yes. Uh, so we are only able to look at general trends. Yeah, it is likely that some people's kids can play all these games. That, that is, I'm not saying that's not possible. And I'm sure at a certain age, all kids could play all these games when they get a certain experience level. But what I mean is, like the difference between a kid's game and an adult game in, you know, is it roll and mood? Is it simple? Can you play it in a short period of time? Does it have a short attention span versus I have 87 options on my term and I don't know what to do, right? Like that's kind of the scale we're looking at here. We're looking at kids games versus gamers games, like hobby yes. board games, hobby board games, where these are, these are look like they're marketed for kids, but are definitely higher. And I, I just, for one, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why is this happening? Like I said, to me, it seems like a new trend. I, someone proved me wrong. That's fine. Maybe this has always been happening. But I don't remember ever getting a game as a kid and being like, whoa, this is way too complicated. Or if I did, it was like, it really wasn't all that complicated. I'm, I can't think of an example, but uh, off the top of my head, like so, something like Thunder Road probably would have been considered complicated, right? Compared to other games that were out. Or um, another one I had, um, I'm forgetting the name, Secret Mission was a little complicated compared to other ones, but like it was nothing compared to, I don't know, advanced squad leader or something my dad was playing or even a choir. I think what's happening in a lot of cases is we have grown up with many of these licenses. A lot of these licenses right. have existed for 20, 30, 40 or more years. And so we associated with them as kids and perhaps we grew out of them. Perhaps we didn't. Some people, some people haven't. Mm. Uh, and, and, so we still have that that association in our mind with kids where there are a lot of people who still embrace and enjoy a lot of those more youthful IPs as adults right. uh, mm -hmm. and are looking for the feel of that IP that they know and love from their childhood, but they don't want Candyland. They want something with weight True. and and that may be what's going on. Um, what's What's not clear, however, is the best way to indicate this to the pop, the populace yes. in general. Uh, how do you stop the parent from going to Target and buying the My Little Pony deck building game for their six year old kid, eight year old yeah. girl, uh, eight year old little girl who loves My Little Ponies or boy who loves My Little Ponies? Um, because they're going to get a shock when they crack that game. Yeah. Now, another aspect of it, too, I think, is, is, geeky gamers growing up to be geeky adults, not only that they're still into the stuff, but that they want to share it with the next generation. 
So I think there's an aspect of that as well. It's just it's more socially acceptable to be a geek and to be into pop culture things, especially childlike things like cartoons, because a lot of the games we're going to mention tonight are based on cartoons specifically. Yeah, and a lot of it is the way pop culture has expanded. Uh, I mean, you know, there is more acceptance with an adult being into what used to be considered for kids only. Right. Mm-hmm. If if an adult wants to go to uh, My Little Pony Con, uh, you know, see bronies for uh, Ellos, that's OK now. I mean, yes, there are some people who are going to shun them, but we shun them. So that's fine. Uh, it's going to be OK for adults to go see the new, the new Disney movie yeah. for adults to go see the My Little Pony movie and things like that. And again, these people are marketable, are marketable, <laughs> too. And so sure. they're going to get products sold to them. Yeah. The other thought I had, too, was was our games just getting heavier are just board games in general, like the, the rise of hobby board games has had people expect more of their games. And has it gone too far? Like, yes, Candyland is kind of a joke. It's it's a predetermined game at the start of the game. You shuffle the deck. You could figure out who's going to win. And, and it's there. It's a great learning experience, learning counting and cooperating and taking turns and all those other things you can learn from board games. But there, in my opinion, there's better games to teach those things. But like, I, and then they're like, did they jump too far? They moved too far away from Candyland because they're like, to me, I play a lot of heavy games, and I got to say, these games do seem pretty simple to me compared to some other games. But I doesn't make them necessarily simple for someone who's new to the hobby or who doesn't know these standard mechanics. And I'm wondering if it's it's a mistake of of designers thinking their games are simpler than they are. Well, I think what we are seeing, however, though, is that many of these games do have age limits that are respectful of the content yeah, of the true. of the weight of the game. The problem is the look, and it, it's mm-hmm. that it's that box, uh, that that view on the shelf when when the mom walks by Target and sees the My Little Pony, the fact that it says fourteen plus isn't going to register oh. over the pony branding or yeah. the Disney branding or you know smurfs or what have you um that that box is going to sell itself as something for someone younger and even if even if it says otherwise you know the op can say well it says 14 plus on the box all they want but they put a bunch of cartoons on it the little girls want to stare at and little little girls little boys whoever young kids adore as we (laughs) as we can talk we'll talk about uh at one point and and to be fair, though, there's also that whole thing where pretty much most people who've been around hobby board gaming for a while know that game companies put 14 plus on the box because they can then avoid safety testing. And it actually has nothing to do with the actual ages that can play the game. How many times have we done a review where we're like, yeah, recommended age is this, but like my oldest can play it. My youngest can play it. We started playing when she was six. Like it's almost every review we've said, yeah, younger people could play it unless it's a content thing. Certain games like Sorcerer are definitely not kids' games for a totally different reason than the complexity of them. And it, trying to explain Tante Coro to your kids may be an interesting conversation <laughs> you don't necessarily want to have at the game table. Or it might. You know what? Oh, that <laughs> might be the way to have that conversation. <laughs> totally fair. Uh, but, I mean, much like you have had experiences with uh, My Little Pony, I have had to, you know, warn parents away from Disney Smash Up Edition or Smash Up uh, Disney mm-hmm. Edition. Because they thought, oh, Disney game. And I thought, and I went, no, I'm sorry, but your, your lovely family yes. is not the one to pick this up right now. Yeah. <laughs> Even if I were to sit there and, and handhold your entire family through the game, this would be a struggling yeah. experience for everyone. Well, we've already mentioned a couple games, but I do want to bring up one more thing first. Is this a good or a bad thing? Is it good that, that like, I don't know, is it, it's, it, I, it, it's to me, it's bad that there's no indication that you don't know besides that 14 plus. But is it a good thing that we're marketing all these kids things to adults and then adults are enjoying them? I have no problem with it. We each our own. If you grew up loving My Little Pony and you want to play a My Little Pony power game, all the power to you. And the game should be judged on its merits. Is it a good game? Is it enjoyable? Does it have replayability? Do you want to play it again? To me, more so than its theme. Yes, theme matters. We've had many conversations about how theme actually does matter to enjoyment of the game. But in many cases, with these kind of themes, I'm like, I can take it or leave it. I have a passing interest in or, or casual knowledge of the thing. Let's dive in. So I don't think it's a bad thing that there are indie looking games for adults. 
Yeah, unfortunately, again, it, it's it's like what I was saying. If if that mom is going to see it in the shelf on Target and buy it for their little kid, disappointment will be you know spread out <laughs> for everyone. There yeah. will be buyer's remorse, and that's bad. Uh, so what we need to come up with is some form of a way of you know way of telling people we want people to buy these yeah we want people to enjoy them but we want the right people to buy and enjoy them mm -hmm. we don't want mom to buy this for their six-year-old because it's the wrong and I, game. I think there's being hobby board gamers i think in some cases you're like well i know that publisher that publisher doesn't do kids games and i think that's the case with one of our games tonight the problem is as games become more mainstream only hobby gamers know who publishes your games. The average gamer has no flipping clue. Even the average gamer you meet at hobby game nights probably has no clue. It's the alpha gamers and the people on board game geek and the people who have gaming podcasts and the people who listen to gaming podcasts that tend to know that renegade games is not a company that does kids games. And there's also um, a variety, like for instance, uh, you know, if, if the fan, you've got a family and dad is a gamer and dad is the one who buys all the games and and asks mom to go out and buy My Little Pony's Adventures in a Quest Tales of Equestria, the RPG game. And they go out to the store and they buy My Little Pony's Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game. Well, there's a huge disconnect between those mm -hmm. two products. Yeah. And there's no easy way to tell because they both have official MLP art right there on the box. And Deanna's got a good point here. So it's bad because folks are going to buy that game, give it to a young kid, and then have a disappointing experience all around on all sides. That might even sour someone off board games in general. And I agree. You definitely could. Like I, the, some of the games we're going to mention today, if those were the first board games you bought your kid and haven't been playing a lot since like Monopoly and Candyland, you probably aren't going to buy any more. Yep. All right. Well, I think as usual, we're going to move on to our list. And as usual, this list is in no particular order. Well, we're going to start with the one we've already brought up a couple times here, which is My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. That is the full name, I think. I don't big think title. I missed any parts of that. <laughs> big, big, big name. Big name, big name. This is a deck building game with some board game elements that has six different resources to manage. It's got you moving around on maps. It's got you facing various different hazards. It plays up to four players, has a variable market, like all of that stuff. When you see this box, all the average person who doesn't know who Renegade Games is and doesn't necessarily know what deck building means sees My Little Pony card game. Great. I want to pick this up. This looks like a My Little Pony card game. I love My Little Pony. This is so much more than a mass market card game. Not only that, it's a fully featured done uh, like deck building game like as complicated as any of the modern ones this isn't even just dominion level of deck building this is a step above that yeah no this is this is a real game <laughs> for lack of a, a better term uh, i know when i first when we first saw this when we were going to crack the box the first time i spent a while joking about it because I, it, it looks like my little pony yep. content it's very cartoony the same art from the uh the cartoon is used in the game mm -hmm. and out of the blue you know we started playing this game and i ate my words yeah. because it was a real deck building game that was more complex than a lot of the deck building games in my collection and other where <laughs> and I, that i've played and please we are not trying to say these games are better than mass market games it's a, a by saying real game, that's not the right way to word it. Just it is a, a hobby gamer's hobby. game, a designer's game, a, a heavier game. A hobby game versus mass market. Yeah. So that's that's a big one. And for more information on this one, just stay tuned. We are going to be doing a detailed review of the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game later this episode, where you'll get to hear just how complicated this is and, and learn for yourself just that, like, there's no way that a young kid could play this. Some kids, sure. But your average My Little Pony little kid that watches it you know on netflix or whatever probably isn't going to grab this one and this is big enough that even light gamer parents would have difficulty teaching and that was my little pony adventures in equestria the deck building game next we have disney sorcerers arena which i will say is much lighter than my little pony adventures in equestria but still is not a light game in any way this is literally a skirmish war game this is Warhammer Underworlds. This is, 
unmatched with Disney characters. This is a a two player sit against each other, build your team, battle it out card game that just happens to have Disney and Pixar characters. And this one is also uh, confusing because it's quite possible that your kids may have played on their own or your device the Disney Sorcerer's Arena mobile game, mm-hmm. which is not as complex. Uh, and there's a whole lot of automated things. You can do auto fighting and things in the mobile game. Uh, and, and you know, there's no movement to take into place. There's no uh, characters dying and coming back. And there's a lot more to this game than the mobile version, which may not be clear. And the mobile version just actually started advertising the board game version. Right. And it will be interesting to see what comes of that. Now, I will say again, this is a solid game. This is an enjoyable game. But my worry here is someone's going to see either that Sorcerer's Arena name, think, oh, the app, my kid loves the app. Or they're going to just see Disney and Pixar and think, oh, you get to play Sn- Snitch and Scull- Sully. And, oh, you, they've got cool little, they call them collectible. I don't know why they're called collectible, but collectible standees where you're battling each other. And then you're expecting to, like, roll some dice and stuff. But instead, it's a hand management um, deck construction game, deck smash up. Yeah, it's not deck construction. It's pick your forces. You use these cards to do all these things, and you're taking multiple actions, tons of decision points, tons of powers to track, ways to level up your character. It's just not the light kids game. Now, I will call out one thing about this one though: the rules in Disney Sorcerer's Arena are presented in four chapters. If you stick to just chapter one, you have a kids game. You're stuck with playing the same four fight characters over and over. If you play just up to chapter two, you still have, I'd say, a grade schoolers game. You can play the game at that level and still enjoy it and buy all the expansions. So props to the op for making the game playable by young kids, but you're not getting the full experience. There's a whole lot of game missing if you only play chapters one and two. It's a game, and it's certainly it's more than a Candyland game by far. Uh, and there's definitely some enjoyment to be had, but there's so much more once you get into chapters three and four. Yes. Next up, we have the ghosts betwixt this one. It's the premise and the artwork. Now, I wouldn't think this one would look like it's for younger kids because it's got a kind of horror theme to it, but it looks like Scooby-Doo. Like, uh, I think there's a very intentional Scooby-Doo look to this game. You are playing a family that's in the haunted heartland of america going by a haunted theme park when one of your kids gets abducted so right there you start to see that there's there's some some context issues that are are a bit much for little kids um it gets worse as the game goes on as that child is later tortured um the big thing though well i guess that's probably the big thing the other thing though is that this is an almost gloomhaven level of complexity dungeon crawler all about maximizing your equipment, rolling various different types of customized dice synergies between your powers, exploration phases mixed with combat phases, semi-complicated AI um, movement for the monsters and everything. This is one that yes, I could see playing it with kids, but I would say teens. And in my opinion, once you get the teen, you're not talking kids anymore. You're talking teens. Yeah, no, the, this one was, was bizarre because not only is it uh, very light uh, and very friendly and, and almost welcoming box art, uh, it's inclusive with a, uh, uh, one of the children in a wheelchair. It's very mm-hmm. friendly. And yes, there is a horror theme to it. And it's, you know, ghosts right there in the title. But at the same time, the art has get really softened the feel so it's you know yeah good scooby-doo level of horror not uh not That's what you expect you know, not yeah. monsters coming out and long into deep in-depth, in-depth combat with line of sight rules and facing rules and mm-hmm. uh, this game was really daunting uh even for me because i haven't gone through i haven't played gloomhaven and i haven't played uh, a lot of the tabletop uh miniature style dungeon crawl games and That's what this was. I mean, it was absolutely a full on tabletop dungeon crawl for Mm -hmm. an advanced to experienced player. Yeah. And then Deanna pointed out something good here is also it was hard. It was really hard. It is probably the co-op game we failed at the most often. So that was uh, the ghosts betwixt. 
Next, we're back to Disney, which are, you're going to see a trend here with Disney sidekicks. This is the one that baffled me the most and kind of inspired this entire episode. I've been thinking about this type of thing. Um, oh, one of the things I should have called out, we have reviewed every game we are going to mention tonight. So please check out my reviews to find out why these games are as complicated as they are. Plus, if you'd enjoy them as an adult, I probably should have called that out at the very beginning. We'll be sure to toss in links to each of those reviews in the show notes. So Disney Sidekicks got the game from the op, and I'm like, eh, I guess we'll see if it's cute. If nothing else, the miniatures are cool. And then we sat down to play it and got our butts kicked. And then we played again and got our butts kicked again. Then we went online and found out the rule book's not very clear, and they've released a new rule book and PDF. So right there, the fact that you need to go online to download the FAQ and the new rule book already drops it out of your kids aren't going to do that range. Yeah, anytime. Then we got the proper rules and played and lost before every player even got a turn. This game is ridiculously difficult for no good reason. It's a Disney game where you play the sidekicks who are trying to save their heroes. What a great theme. That is a fantastic theme. Even not as a, I'm not a big Disney fan, but this was cool. I got to play Apu to try to save Aladdin. And you, you get to play the three little, uh, st- the godparents, the god fairies who are trying to, you know, save that character. You get to play, you get to play the cubs trying to uh, save Scar. Like, I don't know. It was just, or no, Scar's one of the bad guys. I, I can't remember. You play, I don't, you play someone from Lion King. I don't even remember now. Whoever the sidekick was in Lion King, I'm drawing a complete blank on Pumbaa? who that is, right? Pumbaa. Oh, Tamoon and Pumba. Yes. You, you play, I, I can't remember if it's both. It's one of them. But like, it was just, just such a great concept and it is ridiculously hard. This is one the designer has gone on record to apologize for because not only that, it's the op and the op is a mass market publisher. This is a game that was in, to- well, Toys R Us when it existed in the States, but Target, Toys R Us, Walmart. It screams, it says, kick it into hero mode. Everything about this game screams kids game. And, and it's, it's not. And it's by the designer of Blood Rage, Cthulhu Death May Die, Rising Sun, Chaos in the Old World. It shouldn't be for kids. It's still listed as an eight plus game, uh, despite the fact that the community strongly disagrees with that. Yeah. Uh, the, the box is, is eight plus, uh, two to four players. And and absolutely everything about this game, including the setup, like the way it looks on the table, mm-hmm. the board, all of it. The is colorful just, plastic minis. Yeah. This this game screams kids game. And maybe not maybe not six, but eight, eight or ten, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, this is this is a pretty daunting game for any eight or ten for most eight or ten year old uh, children. And the biggest complaints I've seen about this one online are parents who picked it up and the parents can't figure it out to teach their kids. They're like, this looks like a game my kid can play. And I will admit this is a game you can play with your kids if you coach them, but you have to be able to understand the rules. And you have to be a hobby gamer to grasp this. I mean, Eric's fantastic friend of the show, great designer, but stepped maybe outside of his lane a little bit here, trying to go for kids and, and, and wasn't able to bring that, difficulty and and ease of understanding down as much and, and it's interesting to, to see eric talk now that nowadays yeah he a, sit, switched into that channel he's now. moved down into a you know keep it four pages make it easy make it easy to understand bring it down and, and it, that's the direction he's gone in but if this was the pivot point and i can't say for sure that it was yeah. but it seems around the it right does time seem um uh he didn't didn't quite manage it on this one. And as both yeah. said, there has been an apology issued. So yeah. that was, so th- yeah. This is the one that I almost like think they need to like take off the shelves and put a sticker on it. <laughs> like of all of these, this is the, the, the biggest gap between what you expect from the game to the actual gameplay. Although you said this was up. This is not up. I'm pretty sure it is. Interesting. Cause it's only the only publisher listed is spin master. Oh, maybe it's, did we get it from Spin Master? I may be wrong. I could have sworn it was the op. I, I thought so too, but as I'm looking, I'm like the only listed publisher. It's not like a list oh, of all I the guess different... we got that one from Spin Master. So. I, I should check my own review. Let's see. What does my <laughs> review say? Oopsie. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, so, Spin Master. Why did I think it was the op? It really does the feel op like an op so box. Many... The op, the op uh, design, it, it, it feels like an op game. It really does. Oh, apologies, the op. <laughs> My bad. Okay, Spin Master's even more mass market than the op. 
Pim McAllister is a kid's board game publisher. Right. They're 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 like in every toy store. Spin Master is like one of the big kids game publishers. Although would you want to teach Santorini to a kid? I mean Santorini's yes, I could teach Santorini. (laughs) You can leave the God powers out. Marvel United. I've heard that's a kid's game, haven't played it. Okay, there we go. At again, at the basic level. Santorini, yeah. It's Santorini's an abstract strategy. Move place building. You could play that at six. You probably wouldn't play well, but you can play it at six. Connect Four is Spin Master. See, <laughs> no, that's what I mean. They're one of the big publishers. Shoots, of like a, shoots and ladders, boom, boom, balloon. Yeah, they are definitely kids. Yeah. So they said in a way that's almost worse. So that was Disney Sidekicks. Definitely not your little kids' game. All right, this one, this next one's borderline. Um, it mainly ended up on the list because my list seemed a little short, and I was looking for some stuff to add to it. And that is Scooby Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. This is a Coded Chronicles game from the Bamboozle Brothers. Uh, this one, uh, now you're making me question, I'm pretty sure is the op. <laughs> I'm second guessing everything now. Yes, it, it, I'm per- it, it, it's the op. Um, this one, older-ish kids, but not young kids. But this is very much Scooby-Doo the game. You are solving a murder mystery. You are going through a haunted mansion. And it is a fantastic family game. It is a great game for the whole family, but I don't think it's a game kids would play on their own. This is something for playing it with kids, but there is a lot of reading. There's a lot of fiddly bits. And then there's some weird things you have to do with numbers to get what you need to look up that I think younger kids are going to have a hard, hard time with. I think this is a great game to play with kids. And again, this one, has it's the scooby-doo art it's the cartoon art but it's 12 plus this yeah. isn't a little kids game but again it little kids like little kids are are you know looking at that cartoon they're looking at these characters they know and the very uh, uh the very you know friendly kid friendly graphics on the box and you know there, there's definitely some uh some potential for confusion even like the back of the box just has that kids game look. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it definitely it's I mean, it, and it's clear it's on the front and the back. It says 12 plus they, they didn't they're not they're not hiding anything. Yep. But again, with the graphics, it's understandable if some parent, you know, if their eight year old kid loves Scooby Doo, I could see this getting purchased and. The parent mm-hmm. is in for a lot more playing of this game than they thought they were. They yes. thought they could hand it to their kids, and no, they can't. They're going to be playing it with their kids. So I hope they like yeah. Scooby Doo as well. Now, again, that said, we reviewed this one. We love it. This was one of the best experiences I had playing games with kids. It is a fantastic game for families to play together. Absolutely. This doesn't stand on its own as a kid's game. Plus, it's not replayable. Who wants to give their kid a game that you can only play once? It's Christmas morning. Here's your game. Yay, we played it Christmas night. Now it's done. Put it away. It's not a very good toy. <laughs> but that was Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a Coded Chronicles game. Yes. Yeah. These games, maybe that's the secret. If the games have long titles, <laughs> not that, that's where kids. the problem lies. Because yeah. technically it's Disney sidekicks kick it into hero mode. Right. I don't think Ghost Betwix had a... No, it has, has anything that goes with it. Maybe it does. Um, next, we have Smash Up Disney Edition, though. Technically, I think all versions of Smash Up applies as well to a point, but Disney most so. When I got this, I thought I was getting a my first Smash Up. I thought this was going to be a kid's entry level version of Smash Up to get people hooked at a young age and get them into the bigger world of Smash Up and hopefully send AEG lots of money. Then I got it, and I'm like, wow. So I personally hadn't played Smash Up since the first edition. Kind of put it aside, hadn't really kept up, and I got this, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is complicated. There are way too many card interactions. There are too many things on these cards. There's too much to read. There's too much to remember. I got to remember what all these bases do. What's in my decks? I got to remember what's in the other deck over there. And then I got to remember what Deanna has in her deck, and... What, what, what counters? Oh, oh, in this, every turn, you have to put a counter on this. And every time someone moves, you can now use this ability. Like, it was just way too much. And what I find very ironic about this 
is we reviewed this game and then the feedback we got from other players was actually that this is one of the most complicated smash up editions that's ever been published. So not only is it a complicated Disney game, it's actually complicated for smash up, which is just like kind of blows my mind that if you were going to do a Disney version of the game and plus make a new gateway, here's your chance to kind of slow things down and simplify things to be that gateway. Yeah, I was blown away by this one because I'd never played any of the Smash Up. Uh, and again, Smash Up Disney, we, we, you know, okay, well, this isn't going to be an easy version. Okay, we know that. So let's play this. And oh, this is difficult. And then talking with other Smash Up players, learning that no, no, this is difficult in the range of Smash Up games. Yeah. This is on the more difficult end of it. And yet again, you know, I was at a public event and we had this out there and there were kids grabbing for this box going, Ooh, I want to play this. I want to play this. And just, no, I, I, you know, their immediate reaction was that one that we fear the one that you fear as a parent, when the kid goes, Ooh, look at that. I want that on the shelves of the store. And, and it's absolutely wrong for them. And, and, and I don't know. I don't know a way to do it because it's not even as it's even less obviously a kid's game than several of the others on this list. Yes. It, you know, sitting on the shelf, this isn't the most uh, kid friendly box, no. but it's Disney enough that if a kid sees it, they're going to be interested yeah. if they are fans of Disney. And you know, this is, I'm not even sure what the age on it is, but it's a really tough game. Yeah. I, I was shocked. And like I said, this also goes for the rest of Smash Up in a way, because Smash Up is all cute creatures. And, and like, yes, it has robots and skeletons, but even the art style is just kind of cartoony and light looking. And yeah, I want to mash up dinosaurs and ninjas, which sounds great to a 12 year old, which is probably about right. But it probably also sounds great to an eight year old. And the eight year old is going to have a hard time with this game. Yeah, it, it's listed as 12 plus. But honestly, even that yeah, seems that's... a little low. Well, 12 um, seems a little low. I, I, I would call this a 14 plus game because you need to be able to balance all those interactions and keep mm. it in your head. Uh, I guess what I would say is a 12 year old could play it, but it would take 14 to play it well. Yeah. Again, average. We're not trying to judge your kids. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, the, just the, the number of interactions and math going on. There is a lot of math in this game. Yes. Um, and it's, it's even though the new version has some tracking, mm -hmm. you still need to do a lot of math in your head to be able to pull this off. Yep. And that was smash up Disney edition. All right. My last board game for tonight is tales from the loop. Now this one's interesting because I did not find this problem. To me, tales from the loop is not a kid's game nor anything special to be about kids. My introduction of two tales from the loop uh, was from a game convention where I played in the game and I knew it was a kids on bikes game, which is a style of role playing game and style, a genre of, of role playing that became quite popular. It wasn't until we published our review and I started to get comments and feedback and people direct messaging me that I realized that people thought this was a kid's game that because in the game you played kids in the eighties, that it was a game for kids. And that is very much not the case at all. So this was a case that I, again, I didn't realize people thought it was a kid's game. So for me, I'm like, great. It's Tales from the Loop. It's based on Simon Style and Hog. It's, it's kind of dark, post-apocalyptic, dark mirror. You're, you're playing kids, but your kids in the eighties and specifically the eighties, because you had the latchkey generation, right? The parents weren't there. The parents can't help. And the kids solve things. Well, people who heard that were thinking Goonies versus, I don't know what that, uh, I, I don't even know what the adult non kids version of Goonies would be lost boys. Right. And the kids were thinking Goonies and the parents were thinking Goonies and not lost boys, I guess. And, and I was actually shocked to learn this. And I'm like, I get it though. Like if I didn't know what tales from the loop was, and I saw the advertising for the board game there, Deanna put it well, ET versus stranger things. Yes. I know some parents let your kids watch stranger things, but in general, stranger things is for adults. ET is for kids. Yeah, well, I mean, the the problem I think uh, comes from even just the genre, kids on bikes. Yeah, kids on bikes to those unaware seems like a child friendly or youth friendly uh, concept. Uh, the TV show was 
focused on dark. the kids. It was dark. It was dark. It was dark, but it was still again, it was still focused on the kids. Yeah. Um, and so playing as kids. And I think there definitely seems to be somewhat of a disconnect where um a lot of adults don't necessarily want to play as kids or see playing as kids as childish enough yes. that if you're playing as kids, that's probably more of a kid's game or it's mm -hmm. for a bunch of people who want who want to be childish, which is not the case here. This no, is not at all. This, this is very much advanced. Um, but uh, yeah, just the genre of kids on bikes, I think, is deceptive in a way that we don't see because right. of our introduction and our background knowledge oh, of the to concept. be fair when i first heard of kids on bikes i'm like i had a lousy time in grade school and high school i don't want to play that i don't want to role play that and i only gave it a shot because i trusted the dm right and then i found out i loved it it was absolutely fantastic i loved reliving those days especially with the little twist right the the what makes it interesting the whole loop thing and everything that was going on and i mean to be fair, it's a 14 plus game. It's not aimed at kids, but you've got a fun little snowscape with two kids on the cover. Yeah. So it's there's a little bit of mixed messaging there. Um, again, not to anyone who understands the genre or understands Stalin Hogg's work, but again, I, I my my standard thing is you know parent walking down an aisle of Target without any of this knowledge. That's the sort of the, the baseline I like to think of is when that parent walks down an aisle of Target shopping for Christmas, what are they seeing? And Tales from the Loop could potentially fall into that thing where, oh, let's buy this for the kids, yeah. which would be a horrible mistake. So in this case, it was never mass market sold. No. The problem is online stores. You Google, you know, kids games, games about kids, games for kids, Tales from the Loop will pop up in your search. Because kids on bikes and they're like, oh, what's kids on bikes? What's a kids on bikes board game? And you'll get to it. And they, the thing is, people are buying it on Amazon and the Amazon description doesn't say adult board game. You know, it's not spelled out. It just says play kids in an 80s that never was and solve mysteries and kind of sounds Scooby Doo like. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it's a real problem. And I don't I don't know. There was I mean, it's almost like there needs to be an RIA, RIAA, MPAA sort of ranking system that you slap uh, on for board games. Not that I want that. It's, it's a horrible, it's a horrible thing to have agencies like that doing it. Although if it was done by someone like Gamma, who were board, yeah. game, you know, if, if self-regulating rather than an external uh, organization, it might work. But, you know, a, a stamp of guidance of some sort uh, the parents I don't know. And, right, you and, make that. I, th th this is the part of the topic we don't get into is how to fix it because I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know how to make it more clear. Like I don't want to say stop using cartoony artwork when your game's about a cartoon. Like no, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and even even Disney Smash Up. Uh, if you re if you actually look closely at the box of Disney Smash Up, yes, uh, Elsa on the cover looks mean. <laughs> For instance, you know the the art is is slightly yeah. tinged. Uh, with the battle style of the game. And there is some of that in there, but the kids aren't noticing that. Um, the kids are, the kids are definitely sort of yeah. going to see the characters before they see that extra little something in their eyes that mm -hmm. shows they're out for blood. But this isn't just an issue we've seen with board games. It happens on the RPG side of the hobby as well as video games, but we're going to leave those digital ones for some other podcast to cover. So just because I think it fits really well, the first RPG I want to bring up is, well, Tales from the Loop for the exact same reasons as the board game. Now, I will say with the board, with the role playing game or the core rule book, which was the first thing out, no one's going to see that and think it's for kids. It is it is a thick tome hardcover. You're like, no, no, that's an adult role playing game. But the starter set does look very inviting and welcoming. And now I think it's the same thing, though. You're not going to pick this up off the shelf and be like, oh, that looks like a great game for my kids. But you're going to do some Google searching. You're going to search kids, games when you play kids, playing games with kids. You're going to do that. And you're going to stumble on the whole genre of kids on bikes. So it's not really specifically Tales from Loop. The kids on bikes role playing game, obviously, is also not kids on really brooms. for kids. You know, kids on bikes, kids, kids on, on brooms. brooms, you know, the, the whole genre uh, that emerged from kids on bikes is 
potentially problematic it in this is, way. Is, yeah, potentially not child friendly. So I don't need to dwell on it because it's really the same thing as the board game, um, which even ties in some of the same mechanics. But same reason as the board game, there's the Tales from the Loop RPG. Next, we have one Sean kind of mentioned earlier is the My Little Pony Tales of Equestria storytelling game, the hardcover rulebook version, not the later put out couple of years later starter set. Now, the starter set is kid friendly. It's, it's a which way book you read. Someone reads through the which way book. Everyone makes decisions. You roll some dice, tells you what page to go through. Yes, kids. But the hardcover rulebook that I bought my daughter has her second RPG experience ended up being heavier than Savage Worlds with a very similar system where you have a dice pool system you're rolling and you even want to roll four or better. And the bigger your skill is, the more dice you get and you can bump your dice up sides and there's a full bestiary you can buy as a separate book which she owns. This is a full on as complicated as any core D&D rule book or again, Savage Worlds, it's very similar to. I own RPGs that are simpler than this that are mass market published. This isn't even like a simple mass market RPG. This is a full in Game Master required, um, oh, I forget the term, where basically the game boils down to you asking the DM if it works and possibly rolling dice to figure it out. I can't remember. There's a word for that style of play. It's that style of game. And I had no clue. The first time my daughter came down to run this game, she had her book with, I don't even know, 90 post-it notes in it so she wouldn't forget anything. And then she ran it and unfortunately fell into some DM troubles of ending up we weren't doing exactly what the module wanted us to do so we were stuck in a loop I, it's just that it, i not at all what i expected now i guess i should applaud river horse for realizing that people were looking for a story like a, a kid's version since they did put out the starter set yeah it's interesting because i i got a little confused i knew we had done a review and i didn't go back and read it and i remember it i remember some of the problems that your daughter had with it but then when i when i googled it today most of what was coming up was this starter kit and it was very yeah. obviously for kids with no gm and the, the the expansions were listing this starter set and and so there was this confusion and what had happened obviously was that yes they realized that they had made a goof covered themselves and, and turned it into a which way system with a real rpg on the back end for anyone who wanted mm -hmm. to go that far so good for them, but again, you could write, you could buy the wrong book here easily. <laughs> yes, the wrong book, the wrong box. All yeah. right, next up, I have Magical Kitties Save the Day. This one's from Atlas Games, and I agreed to review it. And while I will say yes, it is simpler than My Little Pony Tales of Equestria, the storytelling game. This is not, not only not a kids game. It's also not a good intro to RPGs. And to me, it's being marketed and sold as come play magical cats trying to help their humans, which to me doesn't say come play a role playing game, right? Like they're, they're marketing it to what I would think is supposed to be a new audience, new to role playing games. Whereas, yes, kids can play this. My kids love it. Kids can easily play this. But someone in the room is going to have to run the game and running that game is presented in a way that is for experienced game masters. I can't see a brand new person who's never been a game master before, or never played an RPG before, even being able to run this game. It's instructions on how to run are just vague details and suggestions. The starter adventure is very much just a timeline. Here's all the stuff that's happening. Go. It is so not an entry level product. Yes, you could play it with kids, but there is no like if I gave this to my daughter, She'd just be lost. And and see, this is and this is very much a marketing problem. This one is on Atlas Games because the second line that they say in there at a glance, a role-playing game designed for all ages to enjoy, enjoy that excels as an introduction to the hobby. Yeah, see, it doesn't though. And and if you have an experienced, capable GM, maybe that's true. But if everyone in the group, if everyone who's holding this package is new being introduced to the mm -hmm. hobby, there are going to be some problems. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And now the newest edition that's kickstarting is noir. What kid knows what noir is? <laughs> I'm, I'm baffled by that one because, again, it seems to be not following what they were saying. 
If it was marketed like Tales from the Loop, it would make sense to me. This is an adult game about playing cats, saving your humans. And I got to say, the game's cool. The game's great. My kids loved it. They they really liked it. The mechanics are simple enough for kids, but not like you need that adult. It's 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 a family game. It's it's you need you need the 13 year old that's read the book over a bunch of times. that spent a week prepping before you play. Uh, and interestingly, not only do they have noir, but uh, like the Mars colony and alien invasion books. No, no, that wasn't that was in the original box set. The noir is just being kickstarted now. It's a new printing of the game. It's a whole new box set. Oh, so you can just buy Kitty Noir on their website right now. Weird. As one, that's of, as one of the hometowns. Then? As, as one of the hometowns. Oh, no, coming oh, soon. The... It's still just one of the hometowns, like Mars and all the others, though. Well, it's, I don't know. I didn't back the yeah. Kickstarter. Yeah, so maybe it's not live now. Maybe it ended last week, which is why you can buy it already. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, so Magical Kitty Save the Day is definitely marketing itself in a, in a concerning manner uh, on this one. All right, my last game for the night, uh, before we're going to move on to some honorable mentions from the chats, because the chats called out some really good ones I'd like to talk about, Mm -hmm. is Mermaid Adventures Revised. This one is the one that disappoints me personally the most. This one bothers me. So the first ever role-playing game I ran for my kids was Mermaid Adventures from Eloy LaSanta, which was a standalone, small, soft cover book, fantastic D6 dice pool system, where they roll a bunch of white dice, they roll a bunch of black dice to show how difficult the task is. If they beat the black dice, they succeed. You get to add additional dice if something your character has in your character sheet applies to what you're doing. That's basically the whole system. Very colorful, lots of cool characters you can play because there's not just mermaids. There's uh, the, there's different folk. There's fish folk and octo folk and sea urchin folk. And they give you this whole world to play in and a bunch of sample adventures. It was fantastic. It is it? Still to this day, my favorite game to recommend for player parents to introduce their kids to role playing. Except you can't get it anymore. Eloy LaSanta went on to design the PIP system, which first appeared in Mermaid Adventures, but he refined it and decided to make it a universal role playing system. Again, kind of like a Savage World style. And put out the PIP system core book. But by the time PIP system core book came out, you're not looking at a kid's game anymore. You're using that same dice pool system, but you've got skills and talents and items and equipment and vehicles and powers and all the stuff you'd expect from a universal role-playing system that can handle anything from Western to sci-fi. Then he released Magical or uh, Mermaid Adventures. I don't know if it was just called Part 2 or what. Revised. Revised. So Magical Adventures, Mermaid Adventures, sorry, Mermaid Adventures Revised. And it's now just a source book for the PIP system game. It's no longer a standalone product, and it uses all the full complicated rules. It took a game that was perfect for kids and made it a game that adults could run for their kids. No, absolutely. This one, this one, it was just a shame. Uh, They they took something that was easy and loved and and took it off the market, (laughs) took it away from uh, uh, making it unable for people to buy and replaced it with a system that may be a fine system, but it no longer fits that same niche in the market yeah. that was, you know, has a hole from this original book being removed. So some great comments here in the chat that we're going to talk to before we go into our lobby for any other edition. Uh, it, while we stay in the RPG, Math Guy Dave is mentioning the Marvel RPG. And this it could be a real problem. I mean, with the MCU being as popular as it is, there may be people interested. Now, I suspect probably not because this is going to be a big old hunk of a book. This is a chunky 350-page hardcover, $75, $80 RPG book. The uh, problem, though, is people are just going to see the cover on Amazon. Mm, that's, that's the thing. You got to think most people buy online now. And you're just going to see that picture. And you're going to be like, oh, a Marvel role-playing game. Yeah, I'm actually just going to, I want to take a look right now and see what the Marvel, what the Amazon listing for it looks like. Um, Because that's, I've seen it. I've I've shared deals on it. And to me, that's where you're going to get you. I mean, it does say reading age 14 and up, but see, that's, that's an interesting thing. It's a different thing. Reading age does not, is not the same. So interesting. Yeah, no. And they only have the one, they only have the one. Uh, the one page or the one cover you can look in and you if you actually flip through and, and scroll yeah, through yeah. the look inside you're going to change your mind real fast 
but uh yeah but you gotta click through to do that you have to click through to do that and people don't click through so yeah the marvel role-playing game may be an issue so red meeple ryan calls out that the new avatar legends game um may have the same problem and i I agree i don't know how complicated that system is actually my assumption is that it is not a kid's game its combat system is apparently quite complex yeah so yeah that's an example right there the new avatar because i I don't avatar is such a weird one because i think most people when it first came out were teens that felt like that kind of it was it was more of a gateway to anime than it was a kid's cartoon but i can definitely still see it yeah and one thing another thing daft guy dave and this is going on to sort of another section is ccgs collectible card games true Uh, and uh pokemon for instance sold to kids who have no idea how to play and in the same realm uh launching this fall is going to be disney lorcana lorcana yeah except except pokemon kids can play it's an easy enough game but i'd say that is a kid's game uh and then the next one of course is this lorcana and we don't know for sure but we know we it do know like that this isn't going to be a uh, light game they have said yeah. that this is not going to be for kids but this is going to be disney and possibly pixar um art and I mean, yeah. it's going to have the same problem as Disney Smash Up and Sidekicks and all the other Disney properties we've talked about. But and it's specifically not a kids game. It is going to be aiming itself at the magic crowd. Yeah. So, yeah, this is this is leaning towards tournament play. This is organized play, tournament play, play for money, um, heavy competition. Looks interesting. Uh, but, uh, so there you have 11 games plus a few honorable mentions from the chat there that seem to be marketed towards kids that ended up not being for kids at all. Yeah. What did we miss? What games have you played and were surprised that they weren't actually for the people they seem to be marketed to leave a comment and let us know. Now, if you enjoyed this segment, we would love it. If you dropped us a review on your podcatcher of choice. More reviews we get, they don't even have to be five star, the more attention we get by the platform and the more people who will potentially stumble onto our show. Also, if you've got a question for us, head to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop or send me an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Join us for a look at the new My Little Pony deck building game from Renegade Game Studios, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this pony themed game. My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game was designed by the in house design team at Renegade Game Studios and with development by Christopher Chung. Features artwork from the Marion Mary. Oh, I can't talk. This is what happens. I had too long a coffee break. We'll try that again, just starting with my features artwork. Because it's a big name people should be excited about. It features actual artwork from Mary Bellamy, who is the head illustrator for My Little Pony at IDW Publishing. The core game box, which we are reviewing here, was released in late 2022, and there have been multiple expansions released since. The base game box has an MSRP of $45. This cooperative deck building card game plays one to four players, is for ages 14 plus and has a playtime of about an hour once you get the rules down. Now in this My Little Pony card game, players take on the role of one of the main six, the heroes of everything My Little Pony, comprised of course of Fluttershy, Applejack, Rarity, Twilight Struggle, Rainbow Dash, and Pinkie Pie. The Guardians of Friendship work together to overcome a number of hurdles and then attempt to triumph over a final challenge. This is all done through deck building, managing the resources of help, info, and move, and collecting and spending knowledge, work, and friendship in the form of sugar cubes. For a look at these sparkly plastic cubes and the other components you get with this pony-themed deck builder, check out the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game unboxing video on YouTube. There you'll see the very clear and concise rulebook filled with lots of My Little Pony artwork and gameplay tips from the main six. A punch board with various tokens and standees for the character, a very purple box insert with plenty of room for the game components, as well as lots of room for future expansions, sugar cubes in two sizes and three different colors, bases for the character standees, and of course, cards. Standard size cards include starting decks for four players, character-specific card for each of the characters, Ponyville location cards, and situation cards used to make the game more difficult. 
there is also a set of oversized cards, one for each character featuring their unique ability, four final chapter cards, and 14 hurdles. Overall, component quality here is excellent. Uh, the only thing missing to me was a list of what to put where to best use that insert. But we did come up with a system that works for us. Now, I do recommend putting the standees in their bases once and leaving them there, as it is a tight fit, and you don't want to damage them by taking them in and out each game. So, what do you do with all this stuff? Let's move to an overview of play. So, the players win a game of Adventures in Equestria by overcoming three hurdles and then completing one final challenge before time runs out. They lose if the final challenge reaches its cloud limit, or you can't fill the adventure row, the card market, at the start of a turn. Get started with each player picking a pony and grabbing the matching big character card, their unique character card, and a set of nine starting cards, including five helpful ponies that provide help, the main purchasing resource, mm -hmm. two a good clean race cards that provide move, and one what you need is organization, which provides info, as well as one working together card that provides two help. Shuffle and draw five cards. As this is a cooperative game, you are welcome to play open-handed with everyone's cards just laid out on the table. If you find this leads to too much quarterbacking, you're also welcome to keep them in hand. Now, the adventure deck is shuffled and six cards are laid out, forming the initial adventure row. Then players have the option of adding situation cards to the deck. This box comes with two copies of four different situations. Now, a standard game, standard difficulty, has you adding one of each to the adventure deck before the game begins. Note, you've already laid out the initial market, so none will ever start standing out there. Now, the rules suggest keeping this out your first couple of games, but I don't really see that as necessary. Next up, you set up the hurdles and final challenge. Sort the hurdles by level and build a face-down deck with one card at each level. Flip the top card over, and this will be the first hurdle you will have to face then randomly select a final challenge and place that face up as well. This deck can also be modified to increase or decrease the length and difficulty of the game. The standard game features one hurdle at, of each level, one through three. You could make things easier by using three level one hurdles or more difficult by adding a second level two hurdle, etc. Next, you set up Ponyville by placing the town square card in the center of the table. You then shuffle the location deck and deal one card above and to the left and right of Town Square. These are the locations your ponies can visit during play, and everyone starts at Town Square by placing their standee there. At this point, you're ready to play. Choose a starting pony, however you'd like, to take the first turn. Play then continues until you all win or you all lose together. At the start of each turn, you refill the adventure row so that it has six cards, sliding any existing cards to the right and knocking one card off the end if the market is already full to help refresh it. If all the tasks at a location are completed, that location is removed from the game. Any ponies there are moved back to Town Square and a new location is drawn. Finally, if there is no active hurdle due to one being completed in the last player's turn, you're going to flip up the next one. If all the hurdles are revealed, you just move on to the final challenge. Once all this start of turn stuff is done, you then get to take any number of actions using the main phase. There are a number of these, starting with... First off, play cards. Play cards from your hand to your play area. Most cards generate one or more resources which come in three types. Move, info, and help. Some rare cards also generate sugar cubes which represent knowledge, work, and friendship. Almost every card that isn't a starter card also provides some other benefit. As you would expect from any modern deck building game, these card abilities can do a ton of different things, which aren't worth getting into in this review. Of note, due to this being a cooperative card game, there are many cards in My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria that give things, uh, that give things and help out the other players. Next action is buy cards. Use your resources generated by your cards just played to purchase cards from the market. Now, most cards cost help, but there are some that cost move or info. Any card purchased is placed immediately in your discard pile. Move to a location. By spending move points equal to the number shown on the top right of a movement card and move your standee onto that card. Various things are keyed to where your pony is located. Perform tasks. 
Each location lists tasks you can complete. There are three at each one. The tasks in Town Square are repeatable. It can be done by any number of times by any number of ponies. Tasks at the other locations can only be completed once each, and once all tasks are completed, that location will be removed from the game and replaced by a new one at the next player's start of turn phase. Town Center tasks include swapping sugar cubes for different colored ones, using info to thin your deck, and collecting tokens. Tokens are something unique to this deck building game, as each token represents a plus two in one of the three main resources of move, help, and info. During a character's turn, they can spend any number of these tokens to gain a bonus in that resource. Great for making a big move, buying an expensive card, or completing an expensive task. Each plus two token can also be flipped and used as a plus one of any resource as well. Now, tasks at other locations always include three different things. There's always a low-cost task that costs a small amount of basic resources and gives you something good for it, like a token or a sugar cube. There's a middle task that usually involves swapping something for something else, so you kind of end up on an even field, but you get a different version. And then finally, a very expensive final task. This is going to cost you help and lots of it, but will also give you lots of sugar cubes, the average being eight help for three cubes. Now, this final task, though, can be made cheaper by having certain card types in your hand when going to complete it. For example, one task requires eight help, but costs two less for every pet you have in your hand. The next option is to use your character's ability. Every pony has a unique power that usually gives something to the other characters. For example, Rainbow Dash can give everyone move tokens, and Pinkie Pie lets other characters draw cards. That is, as long as they are with her, and sing or hum a song. <laughs> Once character ability is used, the card is flipped. It can be flipped back on a player's turn by spending one each of the main resources, info, move, and help. In addition, some cards like pets can flip these cards back over without that cost. Next option is to resolve a situation. Situations are bad things that come up in the adventure row, that is, if you are using them in your game. Each of these costs is significant amount of help to resolve. When doing this action, you can get the help of other ponies who can spend any tokens they've collected to help resolve the situation. If situations are left unresolved, they have negative effects, which always include adding more clouds to hurdles. More about that in a bit. Overcome a hurdle, or the final challenge. If your team has collected the required sugar cubes to complete a hurdle or challenge, any player on their team can initiate that attempt. First, you verify that you do indeed have the requirements listed, and then you flip up a card from the unused hurdles deck, and add the chaos text at the bottom of that card as a new requirement. These include additional costs like more resources, additional cubes, etc. to complete the hurdle. When trying to overcome a hurdle or challenge, other players can contribute to any required costs. These include sugar cubes, of course, but they also can spend tokens as well as cards from their hands to generate any needed resources. If you can pay this additional cost along with the initial cost, you complete the hurdle. All costs are paid, and players get the reward shown on the hurdle, and it is discarded. Final challenges work the same, except that you flip two additional unused hurdle cards and add two levels of chaos. If your group succeeds at paying that cost, the reward is that you win the game. If you fail at overcoming a hurdle or final challenge, there isn't very much of a cost. Everyone gets to keep their cards, tokens, and cubes, but the active player's main phase ends immediately. Now we move on to the end phase of each turn. Here, one cloud is added to the active hurdle. If it's already reached its cloud limit, that cloud instead is added to the final challenge. If that hits its cloud limit, the game is over and you lose. As hurdles in the final challenge accumulate clouds, bad things can start to happen. Now, these bad things are called cloud cover and are triggered when the cards hit a set card amount. Bad things also happen when hurdles hit their cloud limit. These bad things include all kinds of things like removing a certain card from the market, cards costing more from then on, movement costs being increased, players having to discard cards, and more. Finally, the active player discards all cards they played this turn and anything left in their hand and draws a new hand of five cards. Assuming you haven't won or lost at this point, the game continues with the next pony. 
Remember, this is a deck building card game, and the many of the cards in the game are going to break these rules in some way. The real meat of any game like this comes from the card interactions and what the players do with them. What isn't initially clear from these rules, and probably not even from this description, is the actual general flow of play in My Little Pony, the deck building game. In general, players will be trying to collect cards and complete tasks to get sugar cubes based on the face-up hurdle in play. Every hurdle and the final challenge is completed by having sets of sugar cubes in specific colors, and the game is really about collecting those cubes. While yes, you'll be spending resources to buy new cards, you're going to build your deck, and you're even going to try to thin it to make it more efficient, all of this is actually being done in order to get the cubes you need to overcome the active challenges. Now, another aspect of this is making sure that your group as a whole has some spare resources to deal with those random chaos texts that do affect you that you have to overcome along with the cubes. This is not a game about buying cards to buy better cards that let you buy ever better cards. It eventually lets you earn points. As most other deck builders are. This is about collecting sugar cubes. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, when I signed the online form requesting a review copy of My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game, I had a good idea of what I was in for, thanks to a fan of our show and Tabletop Bellhop Discord member, Sarah. Due to her, I had heard that this was a rather heavy, somewhat complicated deck building game before reading the rules and sitting down to play. What I didn't realize is just how nuanced this game really was. This is a variable market deck builder that features a total of six different resources to manage and also includes board game elements and unique character abilities. While this isn't quite the board game deck building game mashup of Lost Ruins or Arnak or uh, the Dune Imperium game, this game does have a lot going on and a lot that players have to pay attention to at once. The fact that there are six resources to manage is notable. I don't have any deck builders that are that complex. Most, in fact, have two or three resources, not six. Now, where this becomes a problem is that when people don't realize this and sit down to play, or more importantly, purchase the game expecting to play a kid's game. Now, I've seen this firsthand as the one time I brought My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria out to a public play event, I caught a small child, uh, probably preschooler, walking around hugging my copy of the game. And I had to go over and kind of ask for it back. And then I had to patiently explain to their rather frustrated parents that this is not a kid's game. And basically I had to explain to them that like, yes, I could sit you down and teach you how to play, but there is no way that your daughter is going to be able to grasp this game. Maybe you'll be able to sit and play it with them, like on your lap, maybe have them help make some decisions, but there's no way they're going to be able to grasp this. And it didn't help that these parents were also not hobby board gamers, but were rather expecting to find games like Monopoly at this event. And I had to explain to them that this may be too complicated for you to understand as well. And just seeing the look of disappointment, not just on the little girl's face, but even the parent's face made me like I felt bad. I'm like, to this point, I have not brought this game back out to another public play event. And the fact is that the girl would have indeed loved the art. But the parents might well have been baffled as to how to play, let alone how to explain the game to the child. At best, the parents would have played the game and their child would have been brought along for the ride, contributing little, if anything. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, though, for hobby board gamers like me, and probably most of you listening to this, all this complexity is a good thing. This My Little Pony deck building game is a full-on medium weight card game with solid mechanics including some new things I've never seen in a deck builder before. Now, one of those new things that I really like is this token system. This lets you use cards and spend resources to get plus two tokens that carry over for other turns. I've never seen a deck builder that lets you build up resources turn over turn like this. And I also like the way these tie into the cooperative mechanics of the games and the way you can spend them on other players' turns to overcome situations and to complete hurdles and the final challenge. I enjoy co-op deck builders, and I've played quite a few, and this one really does stand out for a number of reasons. Sadly, not all positive. Mm. But really, there is a significant amount of thought, planning, and cooperation required for a game about cartoons ponies that, as a cartoon, is generally aimed at a younger audience. Yeah. 
Now, the cooperation of the game is also enhanced by the number of cards in the game and the character's special abilities. Now, one direct example of this I want to call out are the pet cards. This box includes each of the main six's pets as adventure cards that can be purchased. Now, each of these pets does provide a good amount of help. If I remember, it's three help. It's pretty good. But they also let their owners flip the character cards back over a flip. And by owners, I mean like the, the pony who owns the pet, not necessarily the player who bought it. And that's the neat part here is that the ponies don't have to collect their own pets. They're actually better cards for another player to have so that when they come up, they flip over your ability so that it's ready to use on your turn. This is unfortunately another mark against it as a kid's game, as the kids are going to generally want to match up the right pet with mm. the right pony. Daddy, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> which isn't ideal from the gameplay perspective, as Mo just uh, laid out in his example. Also, I do need to point out to non-My Little Pony fans that when we say main six, that main M that's main M A N E, mm -hmm. not M A I N, despite speaking about the six key characters in the game. And I really can't explain how much this bothers me reading it out throughout this review. <laughs> I could have added in more because it's always every pony and uh, like the, the number of, of horse puns in the show is is quite high i i avoided most of them but i did stick with the main six as that is what they're called by fans and the creators now another thing i like in this game that sets it apart from many other deck builders is the fact the market loses a card if no one buys anything from it that turn one of the big problems that come up in deck building games in general is that when the market fills up with unwanted cards either cards no one wants or cards no one can afford this can cause games to grind to a halt where no one accomplishes anything. And you won't see that problem here because every round, at least one new card is going to be added to that market. Most turns more than one. Added to this, not only with just the rule that if no one buys anything, it empties out, there are a number of card effects, uh, often on the hurdles and final challenge, that remove certain types of cards from the market, making it refreshed even quicker. All right, we're reading weird uh, rates today. So many deck builders have had to later add solutions to clear the market. And in this, we've got a built-in solution that the game actually takes advantage of with some cards having effects that trigger mm -hmm. if they fall off the end of the market this way. Yeah, that was another neat one. Now, another aspect to set this game apart is scalability. Adventures in Equestria offers multiple ways to either make the game easier or more difficult, which is a very cool thing to me. Now, this comes in the form of the situation cards you can include and how many you include, as well as how you build the hurdle deck before you play. While this is a reasonably common thing nowadays, it's well done and quite flexible, allowing a wide range of difficulties. Now, one thing that did stick out to my kids that they loved is that all the locations, hurdles, and final challenges are right from the first three seasons of the TV show. Now, they are bigger pony fans than I am, but it's good to see that they stuck with existing lore. Now, Gwen, my oldest, also wanted to make sure I pointed out that this lore is just from the TV show and not the comics, but she was a little bit disappointed. I will say, to me, it looks like a My Little Pony game through and through, which made sense once I started doing research for this article and found out that the uh, for this this podcast and found out who the artist is from the game, who is the artist for My Little Pony, which is interesting to learn that this is actually all new unique art as opposed to using screenshots from the cartoon. With the expansions, of which there are three already, there's a lot of room for the game to grow and include other content. Yeah, Gwen wants me to pick them up just to find out if there are any of the comic book stories actually in there which um for all the reasons to buy a board game expansion that's a new one to me now all of this official my little pony artwork from a my little pony artist does come at a cost though and that's gameplay clarity the actual use in play while the artwork is great the iconography and clarity of those icons is not actually it's kind of terrible You'll see this right away the first time you play with the starting deck that everyone has, that a good clean race card that everyone has two of. I have had multiple people I've taught the game have to hand me that card going, what's this card do? Because they totally failed to see the arrow-like plus one move icon on the side of the card. 
And resource generation icons being lost in artwork isn't just a problem on the starter cards either. Happens throughout the adventure deck. Now, I do want to say that it is fantastic that they kept the icons for the different resources in the same spot on the card Mm -hmm. and every card so that you know that anything in a specific position refers to that specific resource. Mm -hmm. But they did that before they saw the final art, which on the starter card is problematic right outside the gate. Yeah. Oh, it would have took a white border or something, a fade. I don't know. Now that's bad, but even worse to me though, is the text and icon size on the location cards. This text is so small, even my kids with great vision can't read them from across the table. Make things worse, many of these include even smaller icons, even smaller than the text. In particular, there is a certain icon that's used multiple places in this game, which is the help cost, which is shown as a small number inside a horseshoe. Now, at the top right corner of the cards, where it's how much you spend to purchase, it's nice and big. But on the location cards, it is tiny. I found these hard to read even at arm's length. And these graphic design issues have literally made the game unplayable to my wife, who has some vision issues. No, some visual issues. It's not like Deanna is legally blind. To her, some of these location cards are fully unreadable. And we, and when we say that, we mean unreadable when you get a magnifying glass with a light on it to try and make it out. Now, you can work out what it is they must be, but that's not the point. Yeah. This is the biggest problem I have with my Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. Once you know it's not for kids. This is a problem big enough that even adults may not be able to enjoy or even be able to play the game, which is the same. Because it is a very solid game. I really hope this is something Renegade Game Studios has seen to be a problem and something they fix, either in a second printing or a second edition or something. It, it's not a tough fix. Two things are need to, needed to change. The art on one of the starter cards and the size of the location cards. They already have large cards in this game. There's no reason not to make these location cards a larger size Mm-hmm. to increase the font size. I understand that there are cost implications, but the game is unplayable by some people because of the choice to make them smaller. Now, my final complaint about this game is actually also from my kids. It's a minor one that didn't bother me whatsoever, but they were, they were upset about it. They want to know why you can't play all six ponies. The entire cartoon this game is based on is all about the core six characters and them working together to overcome whatever's put in their way. They found it very odd that a My Little Pony game wouldn't let you play all six at once. They are called the main six, after all. Now, personally, what I would have liked to have seen is something done like in Japanime games, is a deck building game for Cowboy Bebop, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, where maybe all the pony standees are in play, and there's cards that let you move them, like you can use your movement points to maybe move one of the non-player standees and then some way to like use every character's ability even if they're not controlled by a character player to me that would have just felt a little bit more fulfilling yeah now i haven't played this enough but i assume in its current configuration that six ponies would make the game unbalanced and too easy but that's something that could have been resolved i do wonder given the age on the box at 14 plus if they didn't have a wealth of people who grew up as pony fans or if they didn't have a wealth of people who grew up as pony fans playtesting this even then the game doesn't come with enough decks like there's just not enough cards so we game balance i think it'd be fine because this is one of those cooperative games where you do something then something bad happens usually those aren't affected by player count at all that's why the game works one player just as well as it works four it's just longer with four well the, the problem is uh resources right with six people collecting resources you would have that many more resources available for the challenges and that yeah, that balance possibly. would be a, could be an issue possibly but even then the the goals are usually per player and and all of the hazard clouds are per pony so i i honestly don't think it's that i just i don't know why it's a four player game i really don't overall i was surprised and impressed by the my little pony adventures in questria deck building game it's a very solid and engaging cooperative deck building card game One that's definitely not a kid's game and features plenty of depth and decision space to keep hobby gamers like us entertained. 
Not only is this a solid deck builder, but it's actually one of the better cooperative games I've ever played. Due to the card combinations and the way you can share resources during key moments, you really get the feeling that you are working together while playing Adventures in Equestria. I laughed and joked about the game before we cracked it, expecting something far lighter than we got, and was pleasantly surprised that this was a solid, challenging game for gamers and not throwaway trash to pander to pony lovers. Now, the big thing to watch here, though, of course, is the size of the card text and the iconography. It's small and sometimes obscured by the artwork. No matter what, you're going to have to pick up cards to read what they say. And if someone in your group has vision problems, you may need to skip this game altogether. Now, if this isn't a problem for you and you are a hobby gamer and a fan of My Little Pony, just pick this game up. You're going to love it. With its detailed gameplay and great theme integration, this is going to be a hit with your group. You're getting a solid game with some real strategy and cooperation required. Though you might need to push your non-pony loving friends to play with you. Once you do, they'll enjoy it too. Now, if you're a deck building fan and have no feelings either way on My Little Pony, you should check this game out. Don't let the My Little Pony theme scare you away. This is a solid cooperative card game and not in any way a kid's game. Now, if you don't like deck building in general, I suggest trying to find a way to play this game because it fixes some of the most po popular, I guess popular complaints sounds weird, some of the biggest complaints I've heard about deck building games and why people don't like them. Now, one of these fixes is a variable market that refreshes itself, so you're never stuck with a roll of cards no one wants. And another is the ability to carry over resources between turns through the use of tokens. Honestly, deck building is such a broad mechanic. Hating it is just silly. Sure, there are some games that use it, which might not be to your taste, but there's simply too much in this category to dismiss it entirely. Now, for those that really dislike card games, deck building games, and or My Little Pony, I doubt this one will sway you, and I doubt you're still listening right now to this review because you probably don't care. Personally, I really enjoy this game, and I am itching for more. I've now played enough that I kind of feel like I grok everything that's there. I've kind of seen every card come up. I've we have set strategies for dealing with certain things, and I really want to see what the expansions add to the game and how they mix things up and keep it interesting. Well, that's it for our review of the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. A really solid deck builder we worry people will overlook due to the cartoon theme. Mm -hmm. Keep the conversation going. Join the Tabletop Bellhop Discord to discuss this review, deck building games in general, or even My Little Pony. You can find it at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. <clears throat> Welcome to a review of the first expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances Earning the Tide. Big thanks to the op for sending us a review copy of this expansion. So before getting our feet wet with this expansion, it's important to note that you do need to own a copy of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances in order to use the contents of this box. If you aren't aware of the base game, I encourage you to take a moment to check out our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set review, either on the blog, on YouTube, or as part of episode 201 of our podcast. We'll be here when you get back. Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance is turning the tide. Another big, long name for this expansion was designed by Sean Fletcher, which is the same designer as the base game. It's published by The Op in late 2022. This small box expansion has an MSRP of $19.99 US. It adds three new characters to your Disney and Pixar skirmish game. Stitch from Lilo and Stitch, Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean, and Moana from, well, Moana. All three characters are tied together by each having the Oceanic keyword. To go with these characters, there are also some new rules, which include a new status effect and rules for arena tiles. For a look at what you get in this box, check out our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Turning the Tide unboxing video on YouTube. There you'll see the small single-fold rulebook, a plastic box insert that's fantastic for protecting the stuff but not so great for storage, three new character standees and bases, three large-sized cards for each character, 20-card deck of standard-sized cards for each character, and three cardboard punch boards with initiative tractors, new status effect tiles, and water hexes. The component quality here matches the base game for the most part, and we didn't see anything that would make these cards stand out as different from the ones in the base game. Probably the most important thing in a card game like this. 
The only issue I had is that my Davy Jones standee refuses to stay in its base. Oh, and I still hate the plastic film on the standees in all versions and all expansions of this game with quite the passion. That's a one-time problem. Though we have noted the newest expansion changed the plastic film. Sadly, too late for those buying this one. This expansion adds three new rules to your games of Sorcerer's Arena. Let's take a look at each of them. The first is the rules for constant abilities. These are featured on some character cards and are abilities that are always in effect when that character is in the arena. Note they do, of course, stop when the character is knocked out since they are not considered in the arena. Next are the rules for arena tiles. These hexagons are placed into the arena by various cards or abilities. They may, must be placed on an open, unoccupied space. Spaces with arena tiles and no characters are also considered unoccupied, and if you place an arena tile over another arena tile, it replaces the original with the new one. Note these tiles do not replace the effect of what they're placed on, which at this point really only matters for victory point spaces. A arena tile on a victory point space still counts as a victory point space. Now this expansion comes with one new type of arena tile, the ocean tiles. When an oceanic character, that's someone with the oceanic keyword, moves onto or through an ocean tile, they may add one space to their movement. If the character doing this is the active character, the tile is removed. Ocean tiles have no effect on non-oceanic characters. Finally, there is a new status effect added with this expansion, No Punchbacks, which is a constant effect that prevents damage done by a single rival to Stitch. Okay, now let's get to what people really care about. The new characters and what they offer. So first off, we have Moana, who is all about movement. Much of this is accomplished through placing ocean tiles on the board. She synchronizes well with other oceanic characters due to this, which actually includes other characters in this expansion, as well as Ariel from the base game. In addition to using ocean tiles and other powerful movement cards to get around the board, a number of Moana's other actions and attacks are based on how far she moves. The more momentum that she builds up, the bigger punch she packs. Next, we have Stitch. This little guy is quite the tank. If he ever takes at least three damage in one hit, he immediately gains two tough. He can also banish cards to remove status effects, and his new effect, No Punchbacks, can stop all damage from a single rival while it's in play. Another interesting aspect of Stitch is the fact that he's an experiment and things can be a bit random with him. Stitch has a number of cards that do different things based on whether his life is at an even or odd amount. Finally, we have Davy Jones. Davy is all about pirate curses, not only inflicting curses on his rivals, but also his allies. The more curses that are out there, the more powerful Davy Jones becomes. This is strengthened by his constant ability that has him heal when his cursed allies deal damage to rivals. Now, the other big thing Davy can do is summon the Kraken, one of the biggest attacks in the game. This is an upgrade ability that does a ton of damage in an area, then flips Davy back over, so you can upgrade him again and call that Kraken a second, or if you plan well, maybe even a third time. Some new rules, three, three new characters, leading to plenty of new options. I think it's plen pretty safe to say that if you enjoy Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, you're going to want to pick up this expansion. Yeah, personally, I love the rules for arena tiles, as one of the complaints you see a lot about Sorcerer's Arena is how boring the battlefield is. It's the same every game. What I can't wait for is to see more tiles than just ocean tiles in future expansions, and what I would really love to see are some arena tiles that aren't tied to characters. Maybe some kind of rules for setting up scenery or terrain at the beginning of a game. Now, I must note here that we have a copy of the first printing of Turning the Tide. And since this was released, there have been changes. They've released a six-page errata and FAQ. And one major change is that all future releases will have two-sided player-colored ocean tiles so that opponents can't play off of each other's ocean tiles. And wording on various cards has been changed to reflect this. Additionally, all three characters in this expansion have lowered their XP value by one point. Yeah, that's a significant change, and it confuses me somewhat, because I actually like the fact 
that having two Moanas in play just put water all over the board and made all the Oceanic characters go all over the place. But I am not playing this game professionally or in tournament play, so I'm not as worried about game balance as other gamers might be. So I'm sure this change is done for a reason, though it kind of confuses me. I do wonder if the op will be offering replacement cards for people who have the first edition like us. Now, of the three new characters, I found Stitch to be the most fun. I really liked the cards that were based on life total, and it tended to be either uh, attack cards or defense. It kind of went one way or the other, which was kind of neat. And I also found that that punchback ability really annoyed my opponents in a fun, annoying way. Moana is my next choice, uh, especially when you combo her with Ariel. I really like the combination of that two characters. Because this leaves you with a healer that can really get to where they need to be, as well as a bit of, of a heavy, heavy hitter in Moana, as long as you are able to leave those ocean tiles out and you don't need them to get around the board. Now, my least favorite character in this set so far is Davy Jones, and I think that's mainly because I haven't figured out how to play him well. His whole curse system seems very powerful, but you have to find a way to balance it out. You're, you're walking a line when you're playing him, because while they're out, Davy becomes really hard to kill. He becomes a super tank, but you have to do something to keep those other weaker characters from dying off over and over and just giving your opponent grounds. Well, I never got a chance to play Stitch. I am a big fan of Moana, especially when it comes when in use with other Oceanic characters. Now, Davy Jones is definitely going to be a tricky one to play, but it really depends on that team you're using and how well you can manage and make use of curses. Now, the only real complaint I have about this expansion, um, not counting the fact it's been errata and my cards are out of date, is that the included insert doesn't match the quality in the base game. The base game gives you spots for everything and a way to separate your characters out so you can quickly grab a character's deck. It's just there to hold everything during shipping and to make the box the you know a good size to be on display. It could be way smaller based on the physical components you get. There's no way to separate the three decks. And, and to be fair, the base box also isn't great for holding this expansion. While you can get it to fit, it'll all fit in the base box and there's not a problem with that. It's just not stored in that easy to access, quick, just grab a deck way. Sadly, it seems quite likely we'll see some sort of big box solution provided by the op to take advantage of the need for players to carry more than just the base set and maybe a single expansion around. And if you sleeve your cards, you probably can't even get that first expansion in. Yeah, see, that's not good. I don't know. I, I, I'm with it. I get it. big boxes and that for, for most deck building games, but there's so many additional components to this. With all your tracking tokens and everything else, it really isn't easy to, to make a deck. Like, I, I wouldn't even know what I'd bring if I was going to say a tournament with this. Overall, this is a great expansion for a great game that we've all been enjoying. I really appreciate that it wasn't just more of the same, and it does add new things. You aren't just getting three new characters that you toss in with everyone else. You're also getting some new mechanics. I also really like that this carrot set included characters that had abilities that keyed off already existing keyword. Um, in particular, the fact Ariel's oceanic, so it works in well with the oceanic cards included in this set. I'm, I'm assuming this is going to continue with the other expansion. What this shows me is that the designer is keeping in mind all characters and not just making a little small self-contained set of three characters that work good together. Now, of course, they are helped by the mobile playtesting to some degree, even if, as we've said, this game is quite different, keywords are something that has been carried over from the digital. Fair. At this point, I've managed to mash these cards up with the original, and these new characters are just part of my collection of characters you can draft when you sit down to play a game of Sorcerer's Arena at my house. Everything is sorted into the base box in a serviceable way, and when introducing the game to new players, I probably wouldn't even call out there's an expansion unless someone went, oh, where do I get this game? I'd have to be like, oh, well, okay, these characters come from this and these come from this. To me, it's just all one thing. Indeed, at least in gameplay, they do just fit in nicely. And the only reason you're not buying them as part of the main set is it would drive the cost up and make the game much more difficult to purchase. True. This way, you can start playing and add in fun sets of characters as finances or your preferences allow. Mm -hmm. well, that's it for our detailed look at the Turning the Tide expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. For a bit more info on this expansion and some great pictures of these characters in play, check out my Turning the Tide review on the blog. If you enjoyed this review, please consider tipping the bellhop 
at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, where you can not only support the show, but also get cool bonus stuff like behind the scenes blog posts, copies of our pre production show notes, bonus audio, and more. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Well, I'm going to have to pass the torch over to you this week. There's just been a lot of stuff going on here lately, and I'm finding time to play tabletop games just hasn't happened. If we were a video game podcast, I could go on for a bit, but we're not. On the other hand, I got to crack open the DC Deck Building Injustice set, which went on sale retail just yesterday as we record this. <laughs> uh, I think this was a fantastic addition to the set, the system. Uh, so it is a standalone game that is compatible with uh, the other systems, but it is completely standalone. Uh, I do have the Kickstarter version, so I did get some nice upgrades and a few uh, you know promo cards that came with Kickstarter, Kickstarter only. But uh, the basics of the game, regardless of whether you got Kickstarter or retail, is it is a competitive game where okay. each player chooses a hero to act as their fighter, uh, their lead lead fighter. Uh, each character gets 20 life and a, an energy bar, much like you get in any fighting game. Again, Injustice, for those who don't know, is based off of the Injustice fighting head to head fighting game on the uh, PC and console. And uh, it's an alternate world where the Joker has uh, blown up the Daily Planet, killed Lois Lane, and Superman has decided that no, no one will ever, you know, come to harm in his world and, and becomes a, uh, a fascist, fascist leader, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. using his power to control everything. And so the, the divisions between good and evil are no longer as clear as they once were. Uh, so nemesis cards, as they call them in the game, can be both heroes and villains because within the uh, the world of injustice, some people take, you know, which side you're on isn't as clear as we're used to in the comic book characters. So you're still defeating nemesis? So there are still each other? there are still nemesis, nemesis, okay. nemesis, I, uh, which are basically an, another part of the market. So the game sets up with a normal five card market uh and your standard uh you know cards that are always available to buy mm -hmm. uh and and the deck of nemesis uh the nemesis are pre-built that's one of the great timing mechanisms of the game uh as well as also one of the dials for difficulty of the game uh in the basic game you've just got i think it's five five or four or five nemesis 20 life each uh each player gets up to eight energy on their their charge meter okay uh, and this is this is one of the new and interesting mechanics added to the game is this this charge meter so your uh every time you make a successful attack against any other player you get one point of charge meter and then your player card whatever hero or villain you've chosen to play will have something that gives you a charge on okay. their card and then they also get a special ability which is triggered Whenever they get up to a certain amount of charge, they can spend that charge to activate their ability. Okay. Uh, as well, certain cards within the game will have abilities that either uh, ch add charge add or, or spend charge um, to do things. So it's a it's a it's a whole new variable to add into the game, other than just buying the new cards to buy the new cards to buy the new cards to get victory mm -hmm. points. Uh, at the end of the game. Uh, it is a matter. There's, there's a, a few different things. When, if you die, you get a KO token, which is negative three victory points. Okay. And whoever KO'd you gets a plus one victory point token. Uh, once all the victory point tokens are gone, uh, that's another timing mechanic. A uh, normal game is four per player, quick game, three per player. Uh, once all the victory point tokens are gone, once all, or once all of the nemesis are gone, or if you can't refill the market. The game is over, and it's mm. total victory points to win. Simple, straight as forward, as, as with all the rest of the DC deck building games. But the, the attack and competitive nature was really fun. Uh, we played it both at two, uh, three player and two player. Uh, oh, yes. interesting. I was going to ask, it's yeah. not two player only like nope, the Nope, not the two player only, game. two, three, four. Uh, two, three, yeah. or four. Uh, interestingly, we preferred it at two because it was obvious who you were going to attack. You didn't feel like you were picking on somebody or, or, you know, yeah, playing that's... favorites, uh, especially with a family game. That's, mm -hmm. it'd be problematic. Um, 
So uh, when my son and I played the second time, and it was just two player, every attack was going to against. It wasn't personal. Right. There was no favoritism. Every attack just went to the other person. Um, so it was interesting. Uh, the only thing we thought noticed in our two plays was there was definitely a, a significant advantage to the person who was able to collect more nemesis. Um, okay. But uh, whether that you know holds out, whether there are other strategies to play, um, it, again, we've only played, only played it twice. It so it'll sounds be like it wouldn't combo well with other sets. Like I know it's co-op, like it, it's compatible with everything else, but there's a couple mechanics there you mentioned where it seems like you would water it down. If you added any other set, you're not going to get as many cards that modify the energy. Nope. Plus that whole mechanic where if the deck runs out, well, your deck's going to get bigger. So that's not going to be a factor anymore. They do all. They do have recommendations for how big a deck should ever get and things okay. like that. So there are some things. One of the really nice things is um, there are a lot of dials to adjust both the difficulty and length of this game. Uh, there are actually parts of this game that we have not explored yet. Okay. Um, one of the things, in again, in the video game, as with most two-player combat games, there are locations, mm -hmm. uh, different, different rooms that you play in throughout the, your, the, your fight. Well, they've included those in the game. Oh, that's cool. Um, but they are another level. And so we only played the intro game at first. Uh, the next time we play, we will probably introduce this concept of locations. I wonder uh, if you can knock someone through the wall of the location to another location, because that's definitely something they are, big. I believe the they are double sided, so it's it's possible. Yeah, that could be cool. Um, and but they are, and and they're not just a, a one time thing. There's look, there's there's spaces and and trackers on the location cards, so it'll be interesting to see what that is. And then there's an entire set of cards called clash cards that are for the advanced game only that we just right. haven't even broken out yet. So I'm really interested in seeing how much more. This game has to offer when at the very basic we played uh one basic game and then we played one quick game um according to the you know according to the the setups in the rules and enjoyed them both already so it's gonna Sounds be interesting cool. to see what else you else. haven't played any of the um fighter games before no, have you no, like, I haven't. like exceed or street fighter or no I'm, I'm just wondering how it compares to a game dedicated to being a 2d fighter versus a DC deck building game. This is definitely a DC deck. I mean, I don't, I, again, I haven't played them, but this is definitely yeah. DC deck builder, but a competitive smack, uh, you know, your health, health basher. <laughs> we, we need to add War of Indines to our Sean Must playlist just to, to see what you think of that in comparison. I gotta say, it sounds like it does more than I expected. I like based on, I, I don't, play the game as much as you or know all the details or i didn't look at the kickstarter but i would have guessed here's the characters here's the new world maybe here's one new mechanic and it sounds like it's a lot more than that which is cool yeah no they really went they really went all out for it uh and again I, the the fact that there were so many different levels of play to the game right has really kind of uh you know intrigued me more than i ever expected cool so that's it for uh what we've been playing generally uh what's coming up next uh, as noted in the announcements earlier, Deanna and I are heading out of town next week. So as you know, this will, I'm sure, involve at least some two-player gaming. Now, along with that, we are going to still be here Friday. So I don't know if you're free, but you should be into town. So we might be able to get in a few games before you go, before we go. So we may, uh, we may get a little gaming other than that. But at this point, I, I don't have anything planned. Like, uh, there's some stuff on the obligation list I want to get to. Castellans of Valeria is really up there. That one I want to get some more plays in. I want you to try Siege of Valeria. Uh, maybe we're going to have an, another whole Valeria review. <laughs> I would like to play some more Epic Alliances. Um, what I, my plan is the next two weeks that we record will be the other two expansions for Disney. We'll do one a show because they're shorter. We should be able to squeeze those in, and they're not too hard to write. So <laughs> just squeeze those in with other reviews. Yeah, I'll probably. But again, no promises. I I got nothing specific that I want to get done because well, we're going away. So. I'll probably bring if if we are gaming together on Friday. I'll probably bring Siege home and, and play it over the weekend. So that'll be one that thing works. on my yeah. list. Uh, I'm also looking forward to cracking open the rest of my DC deck building mm -hmm. stuff and reboxing it into the new multiverse box as well. I need to learn the new Rivals uh, Flash versus Reverse Flash game because that's probably what I'll actually play with the kids next time. We and then bring bring back Injustice the time after that just to keep things right. fresh and mixed up. Sounds good. 
Did you ever figure out how the multiverse box works yet, or are you still? I, I haven't even that cracked out? the plastic yet. That'll be oh, okay. that'll be a weekend thing. Uh, they do definitely have a larger size, so they, um, thank God it'll hold the large ca- the large, large card, cards. cards properly. And this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them: Evil John, thank you, John. Donna, thank you, Pax the Paladin. Valentine Pesh, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thanks, Brian. Ron F, thank you, Ron. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Oh, well, the doors are closed. You can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Want to hear your name called out at the end of the show? Or more importantly, want to get some cool bonus content like copies of our show notes, bonus audio, and behind-the-scenes blog posts, please consider tipping your bellhop over at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite After Show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.